Noreda Tiaki, uh, are achieving a predator-free New Zealand, are we dreaming? Now, this uh, particular panel has been sponsored by Manaki Whenua, Landcare Research, Tēnau Koto Katoa. Uh, so we are going to have a rapid fire session now. So we will ask our speakers to come up because this is our focus. Um, Bioheritage research updates these are as we saw yesterday or if you weren't here yesterday they're amazing rapid fire and we get a little bit of an oversight and update on what they've been doing in the last year uh, specifically relating to tiaki so i'd like to welcome please onto the stage at your leisure feel free to jump on up associate professor james russell university of auckland Professor Phil Lester, Victoria University of Wellington, and Dr. Patrick Garvey, Manaki Whenua Land Care Research. Homai te paki paki, kia ora koutou katoa. So rapid fire begins, first of all, with Associate Professor James Russell, University of Auckland. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Uh, I just want to provide uh, an overview, really, as, uh, of some of the exciting projects I've been involved with over the past three years through the National Science Challenge, uh, through my role as the project leader of Project 2.3 High Tech Solutions to uh, Invasive Mammal Pest Control. I want to start with some really exciting work that my doctoral student, Zach Carter, is working on through the challenge. And he's looking at fitting a, a timeline to island eradications uh, through New Zealand over the past 50 years on invasive mammals. And what he has seen by fitting this curve is that island eradications are starting to decrease in the, the rate at which we're undertaking them, but at the same time they're increasing in the complexity of the types of islands we're undertaking eradications on. And you can see that particularly in the, the middle of that curve where there's that dip where we're, we're doing those fewer eradications, but they're more complex ones such as Rangitoto, Motatapu, Great Mercury Island. We see that Norway rats and Kiori remain on a few islands, but ship rats and mice uh, remain widespread on a number of islands, so that's where our island eradication efforts will have to focus, and stoats remain problematic, uh, the kind of wandering minstrels of our ecosystems, much more difficult to eradicate from islands. I've been working on pest-free Auckland Island uh, for the past few years. Pigs, cats and mice introduced since the early 19th century. Uh, it's the largest multi-species eradication in the world, 46,000 hectares being targeted. Trials were undertaken in the past summer and we've successfully confirmed that mice would be vulnerable to a very low bait sowing rate deployed over summer. Uh, there's a very nice video that's just been released in the last week, narrated by Sutipane Oregan. Uh, I recommend you all follow that and, and have a look at that nice piece promoting the work. We've also undertaken some work on predator-free rakiura, uh, a proposal there to eradicate cats, possums, rats, and hedgehogs from 174,000 hectare Stewart Island. Uh, we undertook a social impact assessment in 2017, which found that the community supported the project on biodiversity benefits alone. They didn't require economic benefits to the community, but there were serious concerns around the impacts on deer management and uh, biosecurity for visitors to the island. And uh, interestingly, there's very severe accommodation restrictions on that island, and so uh, en enabling conservation on that island requires actually in uh, investment in accommodation infrastructure. We've undertaken more work in inhabited landscapes and trying to understand the dynamics of pest mammals in those. Uh, in the natural sciences, we've seen a shift from uh, mammalian herbivores to predators being the focus for conservation over the past few decades. In the social sciences, we've seen uh, more surveys and attitudes towards introduced mammalian predators. On the topics of policy and action, we see that there are more uh, non-biodiversity benefits from management of these invasive mammals that we need to embrace, uh, public health benefits and agricultural benefits. But we do need further research on basic biology and uh, long-term studies in inhabited environments. Uh, but with that, we've seen the rise of community and large landscape projects aspiring for a predator-free New Zealand. Uh, very excitingly, in the Waitakere Ranges, we're seeing grey-faced petrels are returning in much larger numbers. Uh, they have better access to food resources in the Tasman Sea, but there are far fewer predator-free islands because there are just far fewer islands off the west coast of the North Island. So there they see higher colony productivity and fledgling rates, but this relies on community and regional council predator control to really enable those colonies to flourish. 
So we've assembled a picture now of the kind of social science toolbox that you might want to use uh, in embarking on wildlife management on, on islands and in mainland areas, things such as community and stakeholder engagement techniques and a number of other ones. So we're in a position now where, where collaborations of social scientists and natural scientists can choose which might be the most appropriate uh, social science tools to, to roll out to understand the community's uh, aspirations and needs and how to move forward with uh, bioheritage restoration. We've done uh, some work looking at new tools to market, focusing on delivering new technology on the ground, such as new toxins with higher species specificity, refining existing traps and self-resetting traps, new lures, repellents and barriers, which Patrick's been working on, and looking at regulatory hurdles to overcome and, and community consultation and support required. We've been working on Māori perspectives in, in mammal pest control. Uh, Tapaki is a place of great cultural, spiritual and natural significance to Northland, a uh, unique previously insular biogeographic area of New Zealand. Um, Ngāti Kuri planned to build an 8.5 kilometre coast-to-coast fence there, which will be the first uh, mainland uh, predator-proof fence which encompasses an inhabited area. Uh, and we're also undertaking a project surveying iwi environmental managers and contrasting their attitudes to pest management in New Zealand with other indigenous people in the Pacific and North America. We've done some really exciting work on, on genetics. We've got a, a map now of rat phylogeography across New Zealand. Uh, on the left there in the purple and yellow, you see Norway rat genetics across New Zealand, and you can see the North Island and the South Island were two separate invasions. Uh, if we look at ship rats, the picture's even more diverse. Uh, the reds and the oranges uh, are different uh, invasions of ship rats to New Zealand. And then on Great Barrier and Stewart Island, Aotea and, and Rakiora, we see actually even different independent invasions. So there's been at least four invasions of ship rats into New Zealand and the history of the country. Uh, we're collaborating with partners at the University of Otago, Landcare Research and Predator Free 2050 Limited, to uh, uh, collect the genomes of possums, stoats, and ship rats, so that we can use those to, to really future-proof some new uh, genomic technologies for predator control. And I just want to finish off by talking about the, the ethics around all of this and, and some of the underlying philosophical questions. So, uh, we have a, a particular challenge with animal ethics, which is reconciling the moral standing of collectives with individuals. How do we focus on saving population, species, and landscapes when we also have to, have to maintain our duty to individual animals and their welfare? So uh, with Emily Park at the University of Auckland, we surveyed some of the key issues and made recommendations for practical ethics with particular reference to invasive species eradications. One thing we noted is that conservation biologists, uh, which all of us are uh, to some extent, uh, are not always clear about where their ethical commitments stand with regard to the ecological hierarchy of individuals versus species versus whole ecosystems. Quite often we just take for granted that we have duties to all of them at once, and this makes it harder for us to have those complex conversations about are we focusing more on the welfare of individuals or do we really just want to save the species as the bottom line or, or somewhere in between that. So to that end, after the government uh, announced its support for predator-free New Zealand in uh, 2016, the National Science Challenge uh, project rapidly convened a bioethics panel of 12 um, expert members, not just academics, but people from all walks of life. And uh, over the past two years, we've, we've worked very hard and we've gone through a number of redrafts. So today I'm very pleased to, to say we've got this predator-free New Zealand social, cultural and ethical challenges report, which is available on the, the table just outside the door there in the, the Kai area. Area. And uh, this is a really fantastic report that we're all very proud of. It uh, addresses our responsibilities to biodiversity, uh, kaitiakitanga and conservation philosophy from both Western and Mataranga perspectives, human dimensions, governance and oversight, uh, the role of technology, and the outcomes we're looking for in a predator-free New Zealand. So uh, this is a great report. There's a hard copy available out there for you to browse through and take away with you, but if you have a look through it and are finished with it, um, it would be great if you could leave it there for others to use. It's also available online through the Crazy and Ambitious website, just crazyandambitious.co.nz bioethics-report, and, uh, and it got a lot of good coverage in the press yesterday. So uh, with thanks to all of the, the groups that have supported this work over the past few years. Thank you. Kia ora James, huge range of mahi. So thank you very much for your rapid fire five minutes. And now we go to Professor Phil Lester, Victoria University of Wellington. Tēnā koe. Kia ora. Uh, 
thanks for having me this morning. I'm going to um, talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the vertebrate equivalent of what James was talking about today in terms of new pest control methods for wasps for invertebrate populations. The mission statement to remind anybody that might not be familiar with it, it's been a while now since we've been doing this, is this. We're looking at socially acceptable, uh, cost effective, targeted next generation technologies, tools uh, that can be used for large scale wasp control. In uh, and, and, and in uh, production ecosystems uh, to protect Tonga species and minimise cost to agriculture. Now we're using WASPs as a model system here, but we're hoping that any methods that we can develop um, through this National Science Challenge portfolio can be utilised for a whole range of other species as well. Um, there's been a whole bunch of, uh, of groups involved in this, so a large uh, number of participants and researchers from throughout New Zealand. Um, there's a bunch of different technologies that we've been looking at. So uh, we've been looking at behavioural manipulation of wasps using pheromones, that's max suckling at plant and food research. We're looking at um, using Trojan mites, uh, mites that have been recently discovered in wasp nests to deliver pathogens. Um, these mites seem to take on the, the chemical smell of the wasps to be able to evade um, them in and deliver pathogens within populations. That's our Bob Brown's work at Landcare. And um, Neil Gemmell and uh, Dan Tompkins and people have been looking at, at Trojan female techniques to regulate wasp populations. Um, can we manipulate or utilise existing genetic defects in wasp populations, basically, to encourage uh, population regulation in, in those populations? I'm not going to have time, unfortunately, to talk about all of those different technologies and, and approaches that we've been looking at today, but I, what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of a taste about two different groups that, that, that have been working on these systems and a little bit of Mataranga Māori um, that we've been doing as well. So this is um, uh, one of the technologies. So this is uh, gene silencing. Uh, gene silencing uh, has the word gene in it, which is uh, unfortunate in, in some ways. This is a, a natural process. It's not a genetic modification whatsoever. Um, and it involves uh, people doing things like delivering uh, double-stranded RNA to wasps somehow. Peter Dearden at Otago University has been working on this. Um, and they've been uh, injecting wasps, they've been feeding wasps, they've been doing a whole bunch of different things in order to, to, to down-regulate uh, gene production, um, an essential gene, for wasp uh, lifestyles and behaviour, right? So if you can knock down a gene, then those populations can potentially die. Um, and they've identified some wasps uh, genes that are important in this. Uh, we've done some work also in a, another invasive wasp species, Polistes dominiella, the, the European paper wasp, um, that shows that we can actually knock down these genes. We can actually have an influence, uh, hopefully, on, on wasp population dynamics and, and, and lifestyles. Um, so I think that's a, a really encouraging technology um, and one that we'll go forward with, hopefully, in, in future research. I was really pleased this morning to hear the Minister talk about we need evidence portfolio, we need evidence based decisions, we need information on things like gene drives in wasp populations. We have been, uh, with the challenge, doing some work on uh, genetic modification and gene drives. Not genetically, we have not genetically modified any wasps whatsoever, but what we're really doing here is to try and understand that and try and gain evidence around how a gene drive might be useful, what the pitfalls are, and all those sorts of things. There are people out there at the moment who are saying, on one hand, gene drives would fail due to population resistance, or gene drives might be a silver bullet and, and wipe out all, species, all the invasive species. Clearly those two different perspectives can't be both right. What is going on? Um, so with uh, wasp populations, what we've been looking at are uh, spermatogenesis genes as a target for a, a gene drive. We've been able to uh, sequence the genome, we've found spermatogenesis genes, we've been able to show that we can use a CRISPR-Cas9 system to uh, regulate those genes, to, to cleave them effectively in here, that's an in vitro test so we haven't modified any wasps. Um, and there we've been doing some uh, population modelling. So John Keane in Ag Research has been doing some population modelling on these. And this is some, a little taste of the results we have, right? So what we're seeing here is, is uh, on the x-axis we've got wasp generations or, or number of years, up to 30 years. On the y-axis we've got summer wasp uh, densities and the number of nests that, that are being observed. What we can see if we introduce a, 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 a gene that, that has a role in partial drone sterility, so we're, we're affecting the spermatogenesis genes, um, then we can see this drive act in a, in a suppression drive sort of fashion, down-regulating wasp populations, 
uh, lowering their average density substantially. This, I think, um, uh, is, is really interesting. It offers some evidence for the use of gene drives in, in population regulation of, of invasive species. Um, there's lots more work around this where we can do things like uh, combine a partial drone sterility drive with uh, techniques such as pesticides and potentially drive populations to extinction. The Matangaro Maori work, I'll briefly touch on that. It's been a real pleasure to work with Ocean Mercer from uh, uh, Victoria University. So she's had a, a big role um, in, in this work. Um, and this is some results from, from her study. Um, so we're looking at, at, at student perspectives at, at the university, really around the different technologies and approaches that, that we're looking at um, within the challenge. And um, from uh, that abbreviated little table that's going on there, uh, what she's found in, in this study is doing nothing is, is really not uh, an option. People want to see something being done about wasp problems in New Zealand, but things like a non-specific uh, species poison is, is actually rated much, much worse. So, so a broadly toxic poison is bad, they don't want to do that. The two technologies that I've talked about, the, the RNAi, so, so gene um, suppression, and gene drives actually are, are positively ranked by, by Maori uh, students in this particular study. So some really interesting results there um, that uh, uh, Ocean's been finding. Um, I uh, would like to finish. I, I hope uh, that, that New Zealand production and conservation sectors and iwis have, have access to new strategies, new tools that we can move away from the biocontrol, from the um, use of broad spectrum pesticides as a result of this. And it is our hope that, that we will find these socially acceptable uh, control methods. So that's really our gain, uh, our objective in the next few years to, to hopefully carry on um, doing a whole bunch of work like that. And a whole bunch of people to thank for this. So that's been a real big collaborative work between uh, Landcare, between Plant and Food, between Otago University, Auckland University, lots of lots of different organisations. Thank you very much. Kira. Kia ora, Phil. So when is a gene not a gene? It's very interesting. So uh, thank you, Phil. And we have one last rapid fire speaker. And could I just ask the panelists for the next panel to go through to the green room, please? Um, unfortunately, you'll miss out on Dr. Patrick Garvey. Manak, uh, no, I've already done that, haven't I? Oh, no? Uh, Patrick Garvey, Manaki Whenua, Landcare Research. Kia ora. Uh, good morning. Um, this morning I want to talk to you about some collaborative research that I've done as part of the Science Challenge and it was only a small part of the overall research of the challenge but it was very important and um, very enjoyable. So we experienced catastrophic biodiversity loss that we've never seen before which is threatening human existence. And one of the key drivers of this biodiversity loss is invasive mammalian predators. And they have been directly attributed to 60% of all recent contemporary extinctions of mammals, um, reptiles and birds. And as we're all aware after reading the report, um, the recent environmental report highlights just how bad it is in New Zealand. And we're experienced, we're the most invaded country in the world. We've one of the highest, if not the highest proportions of threatened species in the world. And we've limited management tools to deal with these. But by contrast, we have also opportunities. We have a network of communities and professionals that can um, help bring out new projects and new ideas. We have funding for innovation, as Pori is demonstrating here with his own design trap. And there's collective aspiration for predator freedom, which is very important because if we aim high and we fall short, we still land among the stars. So what I've done as part of my research is very behaviour-based management focused, trying to understand the invasive predators themselves and using this knowledge to be better able to manage them. And my focus was the stoat and how it interacted with two larger predators, the feral cat and the ferret. And what, unsurprisingly, um, stoats fear and avoid cats and ferrets. They um, keep well away from them if they can because both these predators will kill them. But what is rather surprising is that stoats are attracted to the odour of these same predators. And it wasn't what we predicted, and it wasn't what the literature predicted, but it was a very clear result. If you put food out there with no scent at all, and you put food out there with one of these predator odours, stoats would go to the predator odour every time. So we demonstrated this in pens, and we also demonstrated this in trials in Hawke's Bay, that this predator odour can increase detections of stoats. 
But what we didn't know was, are we able to actually increase capture rates? Will it result in increased capture rates? If we put predator odor into traps, will we catch more animals? And that's what I was doing as part of the science challenge in this part of the research. So it was a very organic thing. These are people that got in touch with me, different community groups, a lot through um, working in Hawke's Bay, but also other people that got in contact in general. And all these different projects were protecting different species, like Kokako and Kiwi and uh, Blue Duck, but they all had their own different approaches as well. So some changed lures every couple of weeks, some every week, some every month. They used different lures, some used rabbit meat, some used possum, some used eggs. Um, so what we wanted to do was a very simple study design that would allow everybody to test uh, the lure approach and see if it's working, but not to disrupt their usual trapping protocol in any way. So what we did was just simply every second trap, you put predator rotor into it as long, uh, along with your usual approach of trapping, and we wanted to demonstrate whether we could increase capture rates. So we did, and we did uh, very successfully in this. So if these are four of the projects that I've highlighted, and we increased capture rates on average by 150% of stoats. Um, so for every 10 we were catching with the normal approach, we were catching 25. And this makes a real difference in, in when every individual stoat can, can damage, can cause such damage. Um, so, and it, it was, just talking to somebody yesterday, like this would have cost hundreds of thousands to roll out if I was doing it myself and had to pay field technicians. But just using the community, it was a project that took me a couple of weeks, but had huge coverage across the landscape. <coughs> And just if we think of it in one particular example there, Ruahini Forest Park, um, there they're trying to protect blue duck, there's 30 breeding um, pairs within the landscape, and out of that we removed 17 stoats. And of the 17 stoats, five of them were removed with the normal trappage, trapping approach, and then there's 12 additional ones that we took out with this approach where we use normal trapping plus predator odor. And if you imagine we would have taken out five anyway, this is an extra seven individual removed from the landscape. And as Jack highlighted yesterday, if you really reduce predator numbers down very low, we can achieve great biodiversity um, increases um, without necessarily getting to or even knowing that we got to zero, even though that is the aim we want to achieve. And uh, somebody, uh, we were asked to think about the future and, and what that is to hold. And immediately, it, uh, a quote that I'd read many years before um, uh, just it popped into my mind. And this is from an indigenous uh, North American Indian chief. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. We have a responsibility to protect biodiversity in New Zealand, which is important in a global scale. And after all, it's not our biodiversity to lose. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you so much. I really am always amazed how much you can fit in five minutes. It's quite incredible. Now, in terms of our questions, we would like you to go through the app because you've been doing it so well and actually know how to ask questions, not statements. So, uh, we will go through that, but I am mindful that some people um, aren't so friendly with technology. Therefore, we will have an option of a roving mic, but uh, seeing as it has worked, could we please um, make the preferred message and offering to go through the app? Noreira Tuatahine, uh, we will direct it uh, to each of our speakers, which helps us as well. First of all, to Phil. I would love to change the name, <laughs> basically. I think the, the term gene silencing um, does equate for a lot of people who aren't familiar with the technology with, with genetic modification, and we're going to be stuck with that, I think. I, I don't think me deciding on changing the name will unfortunately have any effect, much as I'd like to think Why I Why don't we give it a Māori name? Yeah, well, it's possible too. Yeah. yeah. And it'll be nothing to do with genes. Okay, kia ora, Bill, thank you. Uh, James, how will cats be targeted on large islands given the lack of current tools for aerial control that are effective and registered in New Zealand? That's a good question because the answer is not very well. Um, at the moment from the Auckland Island project, we realised about a year ago we needed to uh, address that question, how can we target them for eradication and also do we have an effective detection tool at low density? We've found that 
baited camera trapping is an excellent uh, low density detection tool that we can rely on um, for eradication of cats, but we're still left with that open question about how to eradicate them. The ground based operation on Auckland Island is really financially unfeasible. So in this case, we're leveraging um, international relationships and, and seeing the advances the Australians are making on aerial delivery of a, a cat control tool, a cat eradication tool, and we're working with them uh, to see what uh, of a couple of options will pan out the best and then focus on getting that registered in New Zealand, probably a five year timeline, but in time to, to roll out for a uh, pest free Auckland Island in the next decade. Kia ora. A couple of stinky questions for Patrick. Uh, why do you think stoats are attracted to predator odour? Is that from, uh, from an evolutionary perspective? Um, and then straight on to other predator odours from live or dead animals? Yeah, it's a very good question um, and one I'm still trying to figure out. All I can say for sure is that there's information contained in the scent that's of high, that increases its chance of survival. So scent can convey information such as the identity of the predator, how recently it was at a location, what food it is eating. Um, so this sort of information is available. So although they're, they're extra vigilant when they're going in to smell the, the actual scent, it's also important and increases their chance of survival. And that's kind of the best way we can figure it so far. But exactly whether there's one particular thing that's um, resulting in why they are attracted, I'm not quite sure yet. And did you address the live or dead? Uh, yeah, um, so we used live animals. Um, it was collected from the sebaceous gland of ferrets, so by direct contact with them, we had great fun knocking out ferrets and run, rubbing towels on them. But um, yeah, that's the way we collected the odour. Um, I'll just make sure that in terms of from, uh, there was also a question about ferrets. It's a big issue in Kapiti. Where is that one? Um, yeah, do the lures also attract cats and ferrets? I guess from Ronlin that can cover it too. Yeah, um, so we, with ferrets, it's surprising because ferrets aren't actually that attracted to ferret odour. Uh, well, at least from the, from the odour that we sourced it. They are attracted from odour from different sources such as urine, but that's direct interaction between the species. We have yet to test whether cat odour could be used to attract ferrets in the environment and how that might work, but it's an interesting idea. Okay, question for Phil now. Do you have any thoughts on the possible introduction of the Samurai wasp to control BMSB? Uh, should it get to New Zealand? And that's from Amanda. So somebody from Lanky might be able to correct me. I think uh, it's already been approved. Is that right through EPA? It has. So, so um, it's been through the regulatory authorities and, and uh, had, people have had opportunity to, to talk about it and, and to, to say what they think. Um, there, I, I don't know enough about the wasp itself to, to be able to say it's not going to have any non-target effects. It's quite possible it will, um, but it, it, it's a good uh, tool in our arsenal against this potentially really dangerous predator or pest. James, can you elaborate on the community engagement social science toolbox that you mentioned and where to find it? The examples I gave uh, listed in my presentation were from uh, our paper in the special issue uh, in the Island Invasives 2017 conference proceedings, which has also just been published by the IUCN, and you can find it on the IUCN website or the Invasive Species Specialist Group website. There was also a special issue of the Australasian Journal of Environmental Management at the start of last year, which had uh, some papers from our work on uh, social impact assessment on inhabited islands in New Zealand and from island conservation looking at uh, that toolbox as well. They're paywalled, but uh, I suspect you'll be able to find them online if you Google them on Google Scholar. Because we're allowed to Google, except for maybe on our Huawei phones. Patrick, a couple of questions for you. Uh, it sounds like you had a great experience working with communities. Any tips on getting people involved, uh, doing mahi on the front line, and also about the challenges you've had amongst that mahi? Uh, well, it was actually really straightforward from my experience. Uh, it was just a situation where people, I, I spoke or um, and got introduced to people by whatever means, and they just thought it might, it wasn't going to cost anything, it wasn't going to make their trapping any worse, so everybody was very uh, eager to be involved, and really it was quite painless experience. Sometimes it turned up and, and had a chat with people about what we wanted to do, um, but sometimes it was just contact by email and sending odour over the post and then coming back with all these great results four months later, so it was a uh, Quite a painless experience, really. <laughs> Is that because people, those people are already engaged, or are these new communities that, that have the, been created? These have uh, All the five places we went to had a history of trapping, so they were already involved in going out there. Um, and I think people are very eager to try things that will make what they do better. 
Um, so it, it was just, it was people that were very eager to get involved. So yeah, it was a great experience. So this is for both you and James from Kate. Is there any research going into ship rat attractants similar to the Stoat example? Yeah, um, well, Victoria University are involved with it. Um, Mike Jackson and Wayne Linklater there are doing, um, and involved with Doc as well, are doing long life lures um, based on food type lures, and they're working very well. They're, um, I was talking to Mike recently, and he's getting capture rates over very long periods of time. Um, so yeah, there is some work going into ship rats as well. Uh, that was to you as well, James, and uh, uh, can I just add on, uh, a couple of questions for you. First of all, from Jack. Uh, people are more likely to support biodiversity programs if they affect them personally. Do you know of any research that links biodiversity loss with existential uh, threats to humans? I think there's a lot of work overseas um, in environmental psychology looking at how people uh, link biodiversity loss with um, their own well-being. One of the challenges we have in environmental psychology is whether the best approach is to to appeal to people's own values um, or to actually try and convert them to, to our values when uh, empowering them in biodiversity uh, programs. What we, I think we do have quite a big gap in New Zealand. A lot of the environmental psychology is still dominated by the North American literature, which is also particularly biased by political um, associations, which is not something we see so much in New Zealand. So we, I really want to put a plug in for more um, social science and environmental psychology in New Zealand, um, not just around predator-free New Zealand, but around the entire space but we're, we've got some some interesting results coming out we've done some work on Herald Island and looking at the community's attitudes to, to what, what motivated them to be involved in a predator control program and whether that was more about natural place attachment so they did it for the sake of nature or as it turned out they did it more for civic place attachment it was more about their duty to the, the community which was why they were motivated to do a predator control so uh, it's still a, a, a relatively early field in New Zealand I think but we really need to invest more in some of the great environmental psychologists we have coming out of New Zealand. And where exactly is the 8.5 kilometre Ngāti Kuri fence being built? Um, it's going to be built just up uh, at the, the tip of the North Island uh, where the Tapaki biogeographic area starts. So it's a, a very narrow area there and um, that's a really unique part of New Zealand with some really, really rare species. So they're, they're trying to move forward and get that fence built up there, which will be really quite breakthrough because um, the only other attempts we've had to put up a predator-proof fence around an inhabited area were on Rakiura, and in that case, the community there were, were quite resistant to it. So it kind of shows that when you're working with these community groups, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, just like you wouldn't expect your results in a beach, your biology results in a beach forest system to apply to a northern podocarp forest. You can't just expect that the social science toolbox that works on uh, in Northland will, will, or the particular method that works in Northland would be the one that works on Rakiot or the one that works on Aotea. Kia ora Patrick, can we use scat to repel pest birds? Uh, it's generally thought that birds have a great sense of smell besides seabirds, so it's unlikely that we could use scat, but there is other behaviours that you could use in this Achilles heel. They have very good sight and maybe if you combine that with a sound to deter them, but yeah, although jo Josie Gabrate in some of her research, she's seemed to identify that some birds can identify predator scent. So it's a possibility, but I think it's unlikely maybe other more visual or sound lures or uh, deterrence might be better. So let's finish with this um, strong question for Phil. Eugenie Sage has said um, an emphatic no to Jean, to your work, Gene basically, Jean Drives. <laughs> yeah. uh, has this affected your research? <laughs> Um, uh, no, not, not, not really. I, I don't think the minister will be the minister forever. Um, <laughs> and and the, there might be uh, people that are more open to different tools and technologies as time progresses and evidence accumulates for or against them. So I think time will tell. Do you think the name has been part of the issue for the minister as well? I, I don't know. I don't know where, where she's, this is, you know, I think it's a green background, you know, and, and um, there, there is, has been a strong anti-genetic modification movement in New Zealand. I think, I think we, we are still in that framework. Um, but as time progresses, I think um, there's going to be a, a whole bunch of uh, health uh, benefits to, for genetic modification, as sickle cell anemia is one that was on 60 Minutes uh, last week or a week ago. There's, and people will become more experienced and more knowledgeable around it and may or may not change their mind. Kia ora, koutou katoa. Uh, please give your thanks to our panel.